I don't know what songs we'll be singing in heaven, but I hope that's one of them. What a tremendous song. Emptied himself of all but love. What a thought. I said in the opening service, I said you can take that like a verse and dissect it and meditate upon it and feed your soul uh, with some of those great hymns of the faith, and that is one of them. Praise the Lord for it. Would you turn with me in your Bibles, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. It was a Tuesday morning 15 years ago that the Lord laid this message upon my heart. I couldn't wait to preach it, and I didn't realize I'd have to wait 15 years to preach it. Uh, but as the Lord finally has allowed me to preach through the book of 1 Thessalonians, I have the opportunity uh, to preach on this passage of Scripture, uh, verses 5 through 10. As Paul's writing to the church of Thessalonica, Paul is writing to them, anticipating the coming of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and he is really encouraging them how to live while anticipating for his coming. Let me ask you, how are you living in, in anticipation for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? See, what do you mean by that? What does he, that even look like? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ has already told us that the next thing for him to do for the church is to come back for his own. With the Lord coming back at any time, we believe in the imminent return of the Lord. It doesn't mean that it will necessarily happen today, but it could. It doesn't seem to mean that it will necessarily happen tomorrow, but it could. It means at any moment, the Lord shall, with a trump shout, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But the Bible says until then, our lives ought to be lived in such a way that we're working for Him, we're, we're waiting for Him, we're watching for Him, and even praying, even so quickly come Lord Jesus. But as Christians, we are to be living our lives in such a way that we are demonstrating what the Christian life ought to look like and demonstrating the power of the Word that has changed our lives. Many of you in the opening, as Pastor Seth asked, we, we weren't in collaboration there, but how many of you are, have your lives changed since you've been saved? And the realization is if your life hasn't changed, you aren't truly saved. Because God intends, and if God moves into your life, how can it not but change? Just like if you move into a home, you're, you're going to make something different. You're going to set up the furniture different. You're going to change the color on a wall or something's going to be different because you live there. The reality, when God moves into our heart and life, He changes things. And we now need to model that change that has been made in the Christian life. I want us to look at verses 5 through 10 this morning and look at two areas in our lives that we as Christians ought to be modeling uh, what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in our lives. In fact, this morning, <clears throat> I'm going to preach on the activities of a model church on display. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we sang to you uh, with joyful hearts, I sang, uh, just so grateful what, what Jesus Christ has done since you came into my heart uh, and the joy that has come into our lives as being set free from our sin, past, present, and future and given a secure, eternal uh, relationship with you, beyond a home, a relationship with you. Father, I pray that even as I preach this morning, you know I'm preaching to Christians. I want to help Christians to live the Christian life in such a way that we will be a, a much better example to our community and to our family members and to our, to our workplace. And so, Father, as I, I preach to Christians, I pray that their hearts will be open and receptive to your word and the admonition that uh, Paul gave to the people of Thessalonica, may it be an admonition we'd also receive. But I pray as well that you would draw someone to yourself, anyone listening to this message that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The most important next decision that they ought to make in their lives is to trust truly in Jesus Christ alone for salvation and allow that magnificent change to happen in their life as well. Oh, Father, the burden that we have for the lost soul is great. 
And I pray that you continually bring them to our midst, that we may demonstrate Christ to them. Now guide in the preaching of the word this morning. May everything be done for inaccuracy of your word and to the benefit of Christians. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This tremendous portion of scripture, begin, scripture begins in verse number five that I want to address, kind of an, a way of opening. And Paul is saying, when our gospel, our gospel came not to you in word only, Paul says it was much more than just a, a sermon. It was much more than just a message. And, and let me just give you a little bit of background. As Paul would hear preach to them, uh, other men were with him, and he was opening and alleging that Jesus Christ was Lord. You can read that in Acts chapter 17, that initial coming to Thessalonica. But Paul said it was more than just a message, he says, but also in power and, and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. So let me describe those three phrases that he says. He says, when I preached, it was more than just a sermon. It, it came in power. And part of the power is taking that, a life that is stained with sin and washing it and making it whiter than snow. It, it is a power that can change a life that, that is set in a direction, as, as Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, dead in trespasses and sins, and quicken us and make us alive. It, it is a powerful message. He also says it, it came of the Holy Ghost. What message is there that, that could change a life outside of a message that is brought forth by the Holy Spirit? Dear friend, if what we have to offer you is not bathed in the work of the Holy Spirit, it will just be like an advertisement that you might hear on the television or the radio. But because of the working of the Holy Spirit, He can take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and take a message from the Word of God and impact your individual heart with it. So that is something I, I can't prepare enough to give you a message that will change your life, but the Holy Spirit can take any message preached and work it right into your heart. And then He says in much assurance. Now, we would typically talk about the assurance of a believer <coughs> that once you're saved, you're always saved, you're kept by the power of God. One of the reasons that you are always saved is because you're already forgiven of sins past, present, and future. Pastor Seth again mentioned that, the, the future of our sins has already been forgiven. Well then, what sin in the future can take away my salvation if it's already been forgiven? I mean, just think of the principles of God's holy word, but that's not actually what it's talking about. Paul says, when we came to you at Thessalonica, we were fully assured this is the one and only message you need to hear. You just need to hear about Jesus Christ and him crucified, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul, Paul and the other men did say, ah, what, what should we tell these people about? Uh, what, what good message, what good story should we tell them? He said, we were fully assured that this is the message that you need to hear. It's a message of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. And so Paul, as he came, he said, we didn't just have a sermon prepared. We, we were coming with power. We were coming with the Holy Spirit. We were coming with much assurance. So as they came, they were expecting a work to be done. And because they were expecting a work to be done, look at how he finishes verse number 5 when he says, As ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So first of all, I want to talk about how you should live an, ex as an exemplary life as a Christian. You as a Christian ought to live an exemplary life. Paul was saying as we were moved by the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> to come to the area of Thessalonica, we came knowing we have the greatest message that could ever be told. And we recognize that we didn't want our preaching to be set aside because of the way we lived our lives. And so because of we were concerned about your soul when we came to you, you know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. You know how carefully we lived our lives. In fact, this wasn't the first time Paul did this. He talked about in Acts chapter 20 when he called the elders from Miletus to meet him in Ephesus. 
He says, you, you know what manner of men we were among you. He says, night and day with tears. He, he says, publicly and house to house. We lived a very careful life. Why? So we could impact the lives of others. So as a Christian, we ought to stop and consider how exemplary our lives ought to be for the sake of those who are watching, for the sake of those who are around us. Paul says we are guarding what we say, we are guarding what we do, we are guarding what we are listening to. Why? Because we don't want our lives to be a stumbling block for you to hear the gospel. So he goes on, and he talks about something further that's really going to catch our attention in verses 6 and 7. Look at verse number 6. And ye became followers of us. Now let me just stop. That word followers actually has the idea of becoming an imitator. Someone who mimics someone else. Someone who, who, who decides to play the part as someone else has played it. So as a Christian, Paul says, you know what? We were really careful how we lived, and I'm glad we were, because you actually started doing the things we were doing. Let me ask you, as a Christian, if people started to live the Christian life like you're living, how would that look? Would it be a great testimony for this community if everyone started living the Christian life as you are? Saying the things you say, talking the way you talk, doing the things you do, watching the things you watch, going the places you go, treating people the way you treat people, whatever it may be. Are you living an exemplary life that if others became an imitator of you, that would please the Father. That's quite a tall order. Kind of sounds like parenting, doesn't it? You know it doesn't take very long for those little ones to start doing things they see mom and dad do. And all of a sudden, that kind of rubs off on them quite quickly. I tell people when I, when I walk in the room, I'm the only one Charles claps for. Little Charles is Caleb and Sarah. He just had his first birthday. I walk in the room, he claps. <laughs> do you know why he does that? Well, so often when he was little, if he'd do something, I'd say, yay, Charles, and I'd clap for him. And we'd go out and play some disc golf or do something like that, and his dad would make a great throw or his uncle would make a great throw. And I'd say, hey, yay, and we'd clap for them, you know. So then when I, when I started to walk in a room, he'd start clapping. <laughs> hey, he knows a good thing when he sees it. <laughs> now, what do kids do? They imitate, right? And sometimes you're smiling about that. Sometimes, uh, yeah. sometimes that's not too good, is it? Paul says, you know what, I lived a Christian life in a really careful way. And maybe he knew this and maybe he didn't. But he says the reality was they started living it just like I was living it. And it made me recognize and realize how carefully as a Christian I need to live the Christian life. Because it may be my children, it may be my neighbor, it may be my coworker, it may be someone in the church, it may be just somebody in the community, but it may be someone that starts saying, well, if that's how so-and-so lives a Christian life, I'm going to live it like them. Your parents, we really need to be careful. We really need to be careful because how, how are we raising our children to impact this world for the, for the gospel's sake? What kind of an influence are you having on your child? Do you want your child to grow up to be the kind of Christian that you are? And again, sometimes we exemplify Christianity really well when we're with Christians. And we get together as a group of Christians, but sometimes we're hypocrites at home. Sometimes we're shameful at home. Guess what? Your kids won't grow up to be what you are in church. They'll typically grow up to be what you are at home. 
So Paul says, you know what, we lived our lives really careful, and it's good we did so, because you ended up becoming imitators of us. Ye became followers, he says in verse number 6, as ye became followers of us and of the Lord. Again, Paul would say, follow me, even as I am of Christ. He says, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And, And part of that, they were being afflicted and receiving with joy, just like Paul was being afflicted as a preacher of the gospel and preaching with joy, so that ye were, ye were examples, verse 7, to all that believed in Macedonia and Achaia. So can you imagine this? The people you're impacting now start impacting the people beyond them. Have you ever seen families after two or three generations just kind of totally fall apart? And and you kind of scratch your head and you say, what went wrong? I mean, grandma and grandpa were in services every Sunday, every Wednesday. They're they're going to revival meetings. They're they're on visitation doing all this. Mom and dad seem to be doing well. Now the kids are falling apart. What happened? A lot of times what happened is we've replaced with being a Christian by doing Christianity. And we've done all the things that are Uh, associated with Christianity, but we haven't been what we ought to be as children of God. Paul Paul says, I'm not putting on some kind of a facade. I'm going to be what I ought to be for the cause of Christ. I'm so glad I did because now I, I see they're imitating and now they're becoming examples to everybody else that's believing. And you see this ripple effect of a testimony, how important it is if you ever expect to lead anyone for the cause of Christ and you ever want to disciple anyone, how important it is how carefully you live your life for the Lord. The emphasis this year that I've placed is is each one reach one. Again, I'm not looking at some program. I didn't look anything up. I've just been praying and asking the Lord, Lord, what do you want us to do in 2024? And that's the burden. I'm sure somebody's talked about it. I'm sure maybe there's even a, a program I don't know anything about. I just know that every one of us ought to be trying to reach someone for the cause of Christ. Well, if we're striving to do that, then we ought to be modeling what ought to be seen in a Christian's life. One of the great difficulties in being a missionary when someone goes to the mission field, and I forget the missionary that told me this, but a number of years ago, he said, you know, you you think your, your job's done when you're finally able to share the gospel with someone and they get saved, and you think, wow, we we've reached. He said, but the reality is once they get saved, they don't know what a Christian does. You know, you know, here in America, if you led someone to Christ, they probably have the idea, I ought to go to church. And I ought to probably read my Bible. I, you know, reading Bible seems like a Christian thing to do. I ought to pray. He says, in a, in a foreign country, many of them have no concepts of that. So not only are you trying to, sh- to preach the gospel to them, you're trying to demonstrate what Christianity is. So that once they get saved, they get an, have an idea of what a Christian is and what a Christian looks like and what a Christian does and how a Christian talks. He said for them it was probably the largest of the tasks that they had was to model Christianity so that a community that's never seen a Christian before would know that's what a Christian looks like. Well, purposely or non-purposely, sometimes we use that to our advantage. We think, well, there's so many people in this world and no one's really looking at me. You know, it, it, as a missionary, you're kind of a, in a fishbowl. Have you ever heard that illustration? Everybody can look at you from every side. There's never an opportunity. Think about this. Here you are, a missionary in, in some mission field like the uh, Kilmers in Africa. And they know, they know that's the missionaries. And so they watch wherever the missionary goes, and everybody watches that missionary. Why? They look different, they act different, they, they go about life differently. So everybody's watching them, so they've got to live really carefully, because they know at every moment somebody could be watching them. You know, we go through so much life thinking nobody's watching and doing whatever we want to do. Acting the way we want to act. 
He says, I'm so glad I lived an exemplary Christian life because you began to live it like I did. And now you're an example to people in, in regions around them. Thessalonica was a town. I don't know if you've ever gone to the back of your Bible. I remember a guy saying, uh, one day I want to preach the maps in the back of the Bible. He loved maps. And uh, if you would ever go to the back of your Bible, look at the maps, you see the Mediterranean Sea. And almost in the center of the Mediterranean Sea, just north of it, a little cove there in Thessalonica is off to the, to the west, I guess I will say, the left, but the west of that cove. And if, if you would leave Thessalonica, which is a city, you can go to the regions of Macedonia, which would be a little further west and to the north, or you can go to Achaia, which is a little further west and to the, the south. And, and if you go directly west and, and cross the next bay, you're over into Italy. Well, this church of Thessalonica was a small church plant, but it flourished. It caught fire. And they began to, to minister to the people of Thessalonica, and then they began to minister to the people of Macedonia, and, and then to the people of Achaia. And there were regions being reached because of this one little church. And they became the example of what Christianity looks like. We need to all stop and inspect our lives. Are we exemplifying Christ? When something disappoints you at work, when some, someone lies about you at work, when someone mistreats you in your home, uh, when, when someone uh, disowns you in some type of a family situation, how do you respond to that? <coughs> Are you showing forth Christ's likeness? Are you demonstrating, modeling Christianity? In fact, the word, the word example here, you became examples, is you became a type, you became a pattern, you became a model. So that's where I got the title for the message. You, you became a pattern of what Christians ought to live like. You became the model for them to live up to. You became a type of Christianity. This is the type of person then that we ought to be. Again, as Christians, we need to be evaluating our lives. If each one's trying to reach one, we need to be living in such a way that we are impacting them for the cause of Christ. But I want you to notice a second thing. I want you to notice then also that we ought to be an evangelistic Christian. To be a model Christian does include this idea of being evangelistic. Now, I've already kind of weaved that in because Paul did in those two verses, but I want to evaluate the next two verses, verses 8 and 9. Paul is going to begin to evaluate a little bit more closely how this gospel went forth. And he says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. So he goes, it went further than that. But also in every place, your faith to God word is spread abroad. Wow, what a loaded section. Let me, let me talk about the first phrase. It kind of stood out to me. For from you sounded out. Uh, no doubt you all are familiar with the word echo. And you would somewhat know what an echo is, whether going down into some type of a canyon or some type of a mountaintop, and you're going to say something, and then hear it kind of repeated, and sometimes depending on the beauty of it, like casting a stone across a lake and sometimes getting many skippers, as you might call it, you, you can hear many times the echo coming back to you, and it's the idea of something just kind of reverberating. It's the same word for that. It's actually the root word where we get our word echo. So it's the idea here is something went out from you repeatedly. <coughs> it's the word thunder, to, to thunder forth. It's the word to trumpet, especially to trumpet a report or a message. And again, they would be able to communicate just by the sounding of a trumpet. He said, so from you reverberated this message. 
This message went out repeatedly. This message went out from you. It, it, it was sounded out. The word of the Lord, not only in Medea, uh, Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith to God is your faith to God word is spread abroad. The word spread abroad has the idea to go from a confined place to something that is just spread out. Uh, it, it has the idea to, to go forth. In Christianity, the sowing of the seed and, and the casting of the net it is really good illustrations from the Scripture of what evangelism looks like. Now, I understand that some of you may be burdened for a particular per person, and, and you're really praying for an opportunity to talk to them about the Lord, uh, and you're looking for a, a privileged opportunity to share with them the gospel, and you're praying that the timing would be right, and you're praying that the atmosphere would be right, and you're praying that they're, they'd be open to hearing a message from you, and that they'll listen to what you have to say. And we do a lot of that individual, but the overall idea of, of Christianity is this. We're just going to spread the seed. Last Saturday, at a sportsman's dinner, Brother Caldwell just took the seed and spread it. There were 380 people from our community there. Now what we understand is six identified that they trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. To that we say what? Praise the Lord. But going in, we didn't know who the six would be. We didn't know there would be six. Oh, we didn't know who the six were. It wasn't like six people walked in. We ah, It's that, 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 that. We, we don't know that. But, but what we do in preaching, we just take it and we just spread the seed. Or another illustration used throughout scriptures, you cast a net. It's not going looking for one particular fish. It, it's just casting it out there, hoping maybe to catch a draught of fish. Back when I was working in, in, during Bible college, I would work during the summer. And the one summer I worked where my dad worked uh, at a manufacturing place. Dad was the lead maintenance man there. And I met a guy named Billy, and Billy was quite a fisherman. So Billy and I would work all night and basically fish all day. Mom didn't think it was good for my health. But look at me, Mom. I'm just a picture of good health. But anyway, uh, she can't say much right now. I was just healing from two broken wrists. So anyway, uh, but Billy and I, we, we, we would like to fish. And one, one morning we were out fishing and we saw these huge trout in this stream. We were actually canoe uh, going up the Susquehanna and around Otter Creek. We would go up some of these little streams. We, we would go up the end of the stream with the canoe as far as we could, get out, begin to walk. And one morning we came upon one hole and it had an 18 and a half inch trout in there and a 17 and a half inch trout in there, but they had already seen us. See, they seen you. What are you talking about? Fish see you. And we had come, walked part of the way down the, another stream, and they saw us coming, but we saw these two huge fish. So the next morning, we got the plan together. Going to take the canoe. We're going to go up to Susquehanna. We're going to go up this little inlet here. We're going to walk, and we're going to come from the bottom up, and we're going to cast into this hole. We're going to catch both those fish and go home. Billy cast in first. He was a better fisherman anyway. Billy cast in first. Wouldn't you know he'd get the biggest one? Uh, he hooked that biggest one within 10 seconds. As he's pulling it in, I finally cast mine in, and almost immediately I hooked the other one. And I know because for many years I had that dead fish hanging on my wall. <laughs> yeah, what are you so proud of these dead fish? I mean, they're only that big, but anyway. You know, we went there for the purpose of catching two fish. We caught those two, and with 10 minutes we were back in the canoe and heading home. But dear friend, I want you to understand in Christianity and what they were doing, they were just spreading the seed. They were just casting out the net. Whosoever will, let him come. From them, it wasn't a preacher. It was a church. You know, sometimes we think it's all the responsibility of the pastor to sow the seed of the gospel. Dear friend, it's all of our responsibility. You know why it's my responsibility? Not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a Christian. 
It's not part of my job description, but it ought to be part of my life. It ought to be a part of all of our lives because a model church demonstrates this. This is what they do. A model church begins to see what Christ has done in them, begins to become an imitator of those, and becomes now an example to others. They're the prototype. They are the model. They're the pattern that others should be wanting to have what they have. And so from them sounds forth the gospel. It's a rippling effect like an echo. It is spreading forth as they cast a net and they go across Macedonia and Achaia. And beyond that, Paul says they've gone to areas that we don't have to go to now because they've already reached them for the cause of Christ. Dear friend, what kind of life are we living in anticipation of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Everyone ought to be evaluating how much of a model we are of Christianity. And if others lived the Christian life the way they're living, what joy would there be? What harmony would there be? What gladness would there be? What holiness would there be? What passion would there be for Christ? And then, dear friend, we take that message of the gospel and we take it and we just cast it out. Oh, yes, at times there's going to be an individual passion and a burden for someone in particular, and we're going to pray hard for them. But in other opportunities, we're just going to cast out. We're going to sow the seed. Dear friends, this ought to be the model of Christianity that shouldn't happen in one in ten churches but it ought to be part of every one of our lives. This is the exemplary Christian life. This is the evangelistic Christian life. This ought to be our life. Let's pray. We're an imperfect church trying to introduce people to a perfect Savior. It's time in Christianity that Christians stop tearing each other down and spending that time trying to reach others for the cause of Christ. Again, this is a message that I've anticipated preaching for 15 years. It's hard to say it in 30 minutes. But as I preached, and maybe the Holy Spirit touched something on your heart, how many of you would lift your hand and say, Keith, as you preached on being an exemplary Christian, and what would others look like if they lived their Christian life the way I do? You say, boy, there's some concerns that I have in the way I'm living the Christian life and what I'm modeling a Christian to be. Keith, would you pray for me? Just with an uplifted hand. God bless you. God bless you. Mm. Mm. Many. Oh. Lord, you see those hands. Many of them went up really quickly. Uh, we're, we're not perfect. And Father... If you'd help each one that specifically that raised their hand, that they, they noticed something. You, your Holy Spirit put something onto their heart. You touched something in their life. There, there's something they need to rebuild. There, there's something about Christianity they're not demonstrating well in their home. They're a hypocrite in their home or they're a hypocrite in the workplace. They're a hypocrite in their neighborhood. Father, they're kind of like Israel. With their mouth, they're, they sound like they're really close, but with their heart, they're far away. Father, now, maybe not all are real far away. Maybe for all, they're just taking a super deep evaluation, but I just pray that in everyone that is touched by that part of the message that you would help them in their Christian life. With continuing heads bowed, who would say, Keith, as you talked about being an evangelistic Christian, I must admit there's not a lot of evangelism in my life or 
Maybe it's just associated to one or two people I'm burdened for, which is good, but uh, maybe there's other things that I can do in broadcasting and casting out. Would you, would you pray for me that I become more evangelistically minded as a Christian? God bless you. Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. One last ask for a raise of hands, and as anything else, I didn't point out anybody. Who would say, Keith, as you preached, I'm not a Christian or not sure I'm going to heaven. But you talked about the word came, the message came with power, and I, I need that power in my life and the Holy Spirit working, and I need the Holy Spirit working in my life. I need a message that I can be assured is truth. Would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm a Christian. Would you just raise your hand and let me pray for you? Oh, dear Father, you've seen the hands that have been raised and the hearts that have been concerned with what they have in their lives. And Father, we, we won't be a model church until we model it individually. Becoming imitators. Father, it starts with me. Uh, you talk about that as Paul writes to Timothy to be an example of the believers. So, Father, it needs to begin with me being a better example. And as others imitate myself or some other godly person that they know, so that they can actually become exemplary to their, to their children, to their neighbors and co-workers and family members. And so, Father, I just pray that you'd begin to work in our lives so that from us sounds forth a message that won't be dismissed because of how we live. And a message that will be heard loud and clear because it becomes the most important thing sounding forth from this church. I pray that you would take your word and bring it forth in our lives today. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'd just like you to stand to your feet. The pianist is going to play a, a song. To